Hey there, Tom here, co-host of the Design On Purpose podcast. No, Ricks and myself actually aren't full-time podcasters. We are founding partners of a transformation design agency called Wordplay Studio, which we founded in 2015. Now, before we get into this episode with Graham Sait, nutrition and soil health expert, who's a complete wealth of knowledge and an absolute legend, we just want to put a call out to all the entrepreneurs, business owners, and brand builders out there. We know more than anyone how difficult it is building a brand in this fast-paced digital world. And today, it's more important than ever to stay on top of how your brand is being perceived. Now, it might feel a little overwhelming addressing your brand, you know, it's such a complex system, but Fortunately, there is a clear design process of how to transform your brand and it all starts with something called a brand audit. Now, a brand audit is a process where we deeply scan your organization and your marketplace and give a thorough analysis and identify where the opportunities for growth and expansion are. Now, you are the expert of your organization and of your brand, but having a unbiased, unemotional third party like ourselves, facilitate the brand audit process allows you to see the forest from the trees. Now, if you're looking to transform your brand or learn more about the brand audit process, all you have to do is click the link below and you can book a free discovery session with Ricks and myself to get the ball rolling. We love working with entrepreneurs and we love learning about what challenges you have that are unique to you that you need to overcome. And it's 2023. There's no messing around. There's no time like now. So jump on a call with us. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to connect. Enjoy this episode with Graham Sait. Welcome to another episode of Design on Purpose, the Wordplay Studio podcast. If you are listening on YouTube, give us a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, because we've got some great guests like uh, Graham right here, who we're about to introduce. And if you're on uh, Spotify, same deal. Give us a follow, leave a review. We'd love to hear what you think about the podcast. Graham Sait, welcome. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Hey, it's- uh, We finally captured him. (laughs) (laughs) It's been a bit of a, it's been a, a little bit of a process. I think I first called you two years i think it was in 2020 after doing the kiss the ground course and i managed to track down your email and uh and i was like oh shit i need to get 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 in contact with with graham after watching your your humus ted talk um for anyone that hasn't watched it check out graham sate humus on on youtube it's it's pretty interesting um and uh and then we moved up here and i think actually i bumped into i was telling my friend about about you and and nutritech recently and the next morning i'm walking through town here in, in merbar and i see an nts vehicle parked in the street i'm like that's so weird i was just talking about this last night and i go into the cafe and there's uh his name was marco yeah marco was one of my agronomists yeah 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 one of the the brazilian yeah brasileiro and uh <laughs> and uh bumped into him and then i was like okay that was strange then uh, i think i emailed you after that and said hey come on the podcast and it's uh it's been a little bit bit uh tricky to get you in here but here you yeah, are I it. that's great <laughs> <laughs> so yeah welcome can you um do you want to maybe just start by introducing yourself i know uh you've um you've got a long probably a long uh list of things you've done in your life but uh what how do you how do you best describe yourself um basically as an educator um that's my central role i mean i've started a company 28 years ago called nutritech solutions really trying to drive home the links between soil health and human health and, and in the process started developing a whole range of of biological what we call regenerative agriculture inputs um, but there's a whole education division and the and the, prop, the the company has a home garden division a, you know huge agriculture division the most organic certified products in the world of any company uh, and the education division and we also have this whole separate thing where I've got, a, I've had this kind of driving need to walk the talk and prove that what we can do is producing this food with the got forgotten flavours and extended shelf life and greater medicinal qualities that that could be done without chemicals mm. uh, on a large scale on a on a on a proper commercial scale. So I've bought two quite quite large farms, uh, one in cold climate and one in semi subtropical. And then we also trying to teach the fact that it's very, very difficult food production. It's hugely hard. It's one of the most valuable, most important of all occupations, but one of the hardest as well because you're at the mercy of so many things, including the climate mm-hmm. and the fickle markets and so forth. 
Uh, and you can do the, the best in the world and fail, as simple as that. It's really difficult. You've got to have so many skills to make it work. But one of those skills to, to ensure that you can be profitable, which is what it's all about if you're going to survive, uh, one of those skills is, is value-adding. So, so we've got these, pro- these farms called Nutrition Farms, and we've developed, I think, 10 or 12 products based on value-adding. So we've got a cider, apple cider that's just won a couple of awards from the apple farm, and we've got dried apples, and we've got apple cider vinegar, and we've got juices, and we've got dried turmeric that has the pepper activator in it and all grown organically and so forth. Uh, and a variety of other things. We've got, I think, 12 products in that range. So, yeah, it's, um, so, and that's sort of teaching the potential of, of, of having sort of a multi-dimensional, um, interrelated kind of functional system within the farm so you've got lots of things happening and then also having this value-added thing, which really you just got to have so many strings to your bow to make it work. Yeah. Um, it's so much easier um, teaching and selling fertilisers than it is farming, but it's so much fun farming, you know, it's just this ultimate passion for me. Mm. And what about your story, Graham? Like, how does one get into a position where they're an expert, a soil expert, or a region expert? In my, like my case, are- it was I've told the story before on it, but but basically, it was this weird, really weird, life changing scenario. I had a young ch- uh, young daughter, a six year old daughter, Rachel, yeah. who was hit by a car outside of a school at Yamundi in South East Queensland, and absolutely horrifically. I mean, 110 k's an hour with a six year old child. Oh. You can imagine with a four wheel drive, and so she was. Well, she died twice on the way to hospital and then lay in a coma for three months. And it's kind of life-changing when you're in there holding someone's hand when they're not given any hope because she was, she was an organ donor and we were approached on a daily basis by you know, doctors and so forth saying, look, she's not going to make it. If she does, she'll be a vegetable. Can we turn the machines off? We've got little Sally waiting on her kidneys and we've got little Jane waiting on her eyes or whatever else yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah. But we hung in there and, uh, and didn't make that call. And then after three months, there was... The machines you could have come to know and hate all started beeping at once and and they said this is brain death approaching and so I'm not conventionally religious but I know that there's a, something there I've always been aware that you know and I find it in nature uh, and so I made this deal that should she survive against all the odds uh, I would do something of more value you know I'd been very successful in a variety of businesses at that point but never really given anything back as much you know I looked after my family and myself and but I've not really been on a community thing or done anything a great value for anyone else and so you know I was an A student at a university and so forth so I knew I had skills that could have gone beyond just making money in business and so I made this deal that I'd do something of value if she survived mm. and 20 minutes later she came out of the coma so I had to sleep this night of what was I going to do of value and decided that I'd become because I just started developing this with a small acreage that I had this kind of embryonic interest in the soils and how they worked and re- recognizing that we are what we eat and what we eat comes from a soil that's not what it used to be, mm. uh, and that that would be a fairly important thing to, to develop some expertise. So then I just began researching. You know, I've got quite a good memory, uh, and I just everything I read seems to stick, and it seemed to be almost like I got a little bit of help because <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Everything I read, I'm just, I can quote things forever. I can speak for days on end and just quote figures, and they all just stick there. So and it wasn't like that before. So I don't know how that worked. Maybe it's just because I've got a passion for it. I really not don't know, but and so. I had this whole concept of Nutritech that I was going to be develop this expertise in soil health, human health. I didn't realise at that point this link between soil health and planetary health, but soil, animal, plant, human health, the interrelationships, that I would develop that expertise in human nutrition as well. And then just began researching and then I identified the key people working in cutting edge fields that I thought that were at the forefront of both human and soil health. And I had the funding because I was personally funded at that point to be able to go off and visit them and interview them. And that was my first book, Nutrition Wars, which was just my 26 interviews um, with those key people. And those people have gone on to be the key people, so I did make the right choices. Um, and that book has been, I think, three or four or five times been reprinted. Mm. And in some countries like South Africa, it's been in the top 10 for years sort of thing So of agricultural books. So, um, yeah, that was the journey. And, and it was like I had the whole game plan of even the low logo of the, I was going to you know make it a multinational thing and we're in 57 countries now and we work with teams of agronomists all over the world so I've kind of kept my word and people say oh it must be you know a wonderful thing you're doing as uh, some kind of sacrifice to be out there uh, traveling and teaching but honestly it's just such a ridiculous amount of fun and it's, you couldn't do anything more satisfying than to mm. you know 
entertain, educate and inspire, which is what I try to do, and to see the change and to see the appreciation and to, you know, when you see the people again and they say, oh my God, my son was so sick now, he's so well or whatever, and of course the farmer's making money now and we're doing all these things and they're excited and passionate and you were partially responsible for that and there's just nothing more satisfying on the planet than that. Yeah. It's just like you've been gifted something, you know, yeah. and I love every minute of it. Every time I finish a gig, I'm just thinking, when's the next one? Yeah. <laughs> and that comes from a fear that was so intense that I'd rather be in the coffin than speak at the funeral. And when I first started, I would take a little bottle of brandy, like, you know, those little hip flasks, yeah. and drink the entire yeah. thing. It was glug, 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 glug. Before I went into a shed full of farmers, I had a bit of a slur, bit of a slur in the voice for the next <laughs> couple of sentences. And then I'd eat some peppermints so they wouldn't think I was alcoholic. And then realised I would be six months in if I kept it up. So then I vomited for almost 10 years before I talked. There was that much of a fear. So if I was lying in a gutter with my veins cut from an accident, knowing the ambulance wouldn't make it on time and evaluating what was left of my life, I would, that would be my greatest achievement, that I'd turn my greatest fear into my greatest love. Because wow. I just love teaching. It's just mm. like I say, it's such an important thing to do and I just absolutely love it. So, yeah. Wow. Was, it, was this my, post your daughter's incident though or is it no that was post like incident so well, yeah no i already had the fear thing it was uh -huh. just it came right back from university when i did this presentation uh because i'd had all a's i had this huge crowd there because it was just short short term and i had such a good memory those four four you know question q and a questions are ridiculous really because they just test your short-term memory i'd read that i was a musician touring the country and come home for two days before the exam and just take no dose and just read and memorise yeah. everything and then sit there and get A's because it was so easy. But that this one wasn't, this particular international relations paper, I had to actually present a, a, a whole theory of international relations. And I just thought, well, no one's going to be there. It's eight o'clock in the morning, freezing cold morning in Palmerston, North New Zealand. I'll just stitch together a few things. And I got walk in there and all the lecturers, all the tutors, because I'd had the good grades, they thought it was going to be something special. And I made such an unbelievable idiot. All I wanted to do was hide under the pot. I was, I was freezing cold frost morning and even my jersey was soaked in sweat. I mean, on the whole, <laughs> everything was so, it was just like, all I wanted to do was escape. They just kept on asking these questions I couldn't answer and I couldn't even bullshit my way out of them. And that was the start of the fear. And that was the fear I had to overcome. So, yeah. Wow. Um, very interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> Almost as if it was put there for a reason. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's strange, isn't it? And, and what about just, just staying on, on uh, the company for a, a little bit? You know, especially today, I, I know the, the world's in a state where I guess a lot of the things you talk about are things that the way the world used to be just anyway. And, you know, with all these, um, you know, chemicals and diff industrial farming processes and, you know, all of this sort of stuff we, we are really in now. How did you, where did you start with the company and also how has it been uh, going kind of against the grain in that, in that instance or have you not really found like you've been against the grain? Has it been? No, no, it was very much, um, you know, it was just a trickle of an interest and you really had all these folded arms when you first started going in to talk. Oh, I'm going to unfold my arms at this point. <laughs> 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 it, it had, you know, when you walked into a, sh a farm shed or wherever, it was people like, what the hell is this shit about sort of thing initially. And that's changed. It's been almost like a like there's been some kind of switch flicked in the last five years, and everyone who's involved in this has noted the same thing. And there's really, it's quite safe to say there's a revolution underway currently. It's just the regenerative model is we used to call it biological farming, and then uh, it was comes from a friend of mine, Gary Zimmer, who coined that term. And all of us in that kind of middle ground between organics and conventional, we called it biological. And then uh, I had this big large scale dairy farmers who were going to brand their milk, which is demonstrably superior using these kind of things I'd learned. Um, they were going to call it real milk from biological far dairy farming. And they they actually asked the public about the term, and none of us had ever done it. We'd used it for 15 years at that point. And the average person in the public, over 72% of the correspondents, um, thought of little guys in white coats tinkering with jeans, so they thought of biological warfare when they heard that term. Um, so that's when I thought, what else can we use? And I came up with the term nutrition nutrition farming. Is, and since then, it's kind of evolved globally into this regenerative agriculture term instead of either sustainable, which of course is just sustaining an existing model versus the regenerative yeah. model, which is changing it for the better. Um, and the nutrition side of it, or the nutrition farming thing, is simply that it all comes back to nutrition, you know. 
a fungal disease is not a deficiency of a fungicide. Uh, cancer is not a sh- deficiency of chemotherapy. There's a root cause, and this is all about getting down to what mm. causes things and addressing that root cause. We've been talking about that a lot, actually. Yeah. It's one of the things that um, our teachers talk about a lot, and that's around the cause and effect. And a lot of the time you think that the effect is the problem, but it's actually not the problem at all, and you really need to address the system to actually understand yeah. What the actual problem is. Yes. Because um, a lot of the times it's just the effect that you're dealing with. Yes, that's very and, accurate. And labeling it as the problem. Yeah. And there's probably symptom. so much of that goes, yeah, it's a symptom, not the system. Yeah. Yeah. And from the perspective of just health and the declining health of our soils and subsequent declining health of the food that we're eating, and there are multiple papers that demonstrate this declining nutrition and so forth. But it's not just the nutrition. I mean, the, the, chemical side of it and that you know remaining chemistry so we did the trial work uh, and we showed that you know you could get away with a few parts from a unit of diethane or glyphosate on the food in that rat test for three months but the two things that were never made clear and really people need to understand them uh, one of them is called bioaccumulation how does your body manage the 11 residues that are commonly present on a snow pea for example or the nine residues that are present uh, on the tomato uh, even in tiny amounts, but how does your body manage them? Well, your most important organ is not your heart, it's your liver, and your liver, of course, is charged with things like digestion, but more importantly, or as importantly, is charged with a two-stage detoxification system, which is pretty important in a world with 74,000 registered chemicals. So the liver's got a means by which it can handle anything, any contaminant that's natural. It has a pathway to try and minimise the damage, so it could be arsenic or, or mercury or lead or whatever, or mm-hmm. a snake bite. Um, but And some of the chemicals we've developed are actually just copied off nature, but there's a whole suite of them that we came up with that are actually completely new. And the the liver looks at that structure with whatever way it's got of sensing and says, what the hell is this thing? Uh, It's not good. And so it pumps it off and stores it. And Mm -hmm. largely in the fat cells, Mm -hmm. that's why it's so dangerous to lose weight rapidly because whatever chemicals you've got in your body, they're stored in your fat and they're released when you lose weight rapidly. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get really sick. Uh, and of course, that's something to keep really in mind. It's kind of like a karma thing, really. You take those confinement yeah, animals and you, you, ta- you take the confinement animals and you feed them crap, and then think again when you're eating the chewing the fat on the bacon because that's, that's where it. it's all accumulated. So that bioaccumulation. When we look at one of the studies on children, which was seven, eight years back, US, you can't even find it on the internet at the time, and I. And I should have actually, I had it printed out and I can't focus one of my PAs has put it somewhere, but that study was 1,400 school kids looking at the 13 most commonly used farm chemicals and they looked, you know, with, with urine, blood and tissue from what I understand. But the horror show of the finding was that all 1,400 kids had unacceptable levels according to FDA standards of all 13 farm chemicals and that's from the tissue and that's partially mm. related to this bioaccumulation. So you've got these chemicals sitting there like a time bomb and most of them are farmers. It's, there are things like far infrared saunas which are really, really effective at pumping into that fat and pumping mm. that residue out and it's so common for, for farmers to have their first sauna and this towel to stink of a really unmistakable smell, which is the chemical 2,4-D. It just stinks on your towel because it's I'd been love sitting to know there. what these smells smell like. Yeah, There's a yeah, lot you of need smells. To. We've been we've been talking about this a lot, like just change of body odors and things. Yeah, and trying to work since we out moved what up here, that our body odors have changed. So yeah, yeah, what the smells are. Yeah, you know, yeah it'd be very interesting to know. Um, and so you, then that's the instant. That's a very good technology. So that's number one. We weren't told about bioaccumulation, but the second thing we weren't told. Um, it's called the cocktail effect and and, you know you've got your nine residues or your 11 residues and if you understand anything about chemistry you know you take three chemicals and put them together you'll get a fourth or a fifth and there's zero research on the fourth or the fifth no one's looked and the only time I've ever heard about it was a billionaire I met at a dinner dinner party who's had lost three wives to cancer and he funded research and to 100 combinations of, the, of 10 commonly used farm chemicals. So 10 chemicals between 1 and 100% there's over a million combinations. He looked at just 100 in a three-year study and found three new class 3 carcinogens which proved in that yeah. short time frame that animals got cancer from that new combination, a little less ethical to prove that with humans in the same time span. So we can assume there's a problem. Well, those are the two things we weren't told about. And, you know, we've got things like there is no debates about the root cause of something like childhood leukemia, the largest killer of our kids. And then we see these studies and say, oh my God, you know, it's, uh, it's part of the story. And, and it's, you can't, I sort of, I struggle because 
It's so basic. Anyone can Google anything. And all I suggest, if you're farming, just for your own sake, to understand it's on your skin, it's in your body. It's the fastest way straight through. There's no mediating mm. gut influence. It's straight from the skin into the blood, into your body, around your organs. And if you've got something on your skin, you've got it in your body. Uh, and just know what you're dealing with, just for your own sake, because I love farmers, to, to know yeah. how toxic the materials are. And all you've got to do is take the active from any fungicide, pesticide, and herbicide. I'm challenging you, challenging you to any fungicide, herbicide or pesticide or nematicide, Google the active ingredient and beside the word put that active ingredient and cancer or that active ingredient and neurodegeneration and you'll find that mm. all of them are linked. Every single, you can't find one that doesn't have a link, that doesn't have some research. So then you realise there's no pulling the wool over anyone's eyes. They're toxic materials that really shouldn't be in the food chain and we've been convinced and sort of indoctrinated to believe we can't produce food without them, and it's actually not correct. So the whole approach is about how you can do that, how you can still... And, the, and what people think is, oh, you've got to have a sacrifice when I um, you know, reduce my chemical usage, and that's not the case. I mean, we've got people like Driscoll's Berries, the largest organic producers in the world, their organic divisions out yielding their conventional division. That's old-school thinking to think that you sacrifice when you uh, it's just you've got to learn the new road to Rome it's just a different road you've got limitations you can't do this you mm. can't do that what can you do instead you just need to know this there's zero reason that there should be less yield and there should be much more resilience when you're doing all the right things and that's what we call it nutrition uh, resilience and, and resistance to disease and insects is all about nutrition and, and nutrition is minerals microbes and organic matter and the interplay between those three things and when you understand how that little cycle works then things can change and they are yeah. and they do and like i mean these findings seem quite alarming i mean when you when you're putting these things together and you're kind of understanding what's going on it's i mean that's enough to scare it should be enough to scare you right how how, how do you go about um, getting that information across to people is it is it accepted when well you the most initiate? important the most important thing from a farmer's perspective um, is that you le leverage most farmers are leveraged up to the eyeballs you know yeah. they've got loans they have often operating on an overdraft they've got all of the challenge of the brave new world of climate change farming which is not easy and so really for them the dominant change thing i mean some people obviously got children and they're worried about that and that's yep. good and they should be but for a lot of people they just got to survive you know they got to put the kids through school they got to pay off their mortgage and so forth so really the, the the greatest way to get people to recognize that there's some value and change is to demonstrate that it can be profitable and that's the bottom yep. line with everything you got to make money or you don't survive you don't have a farm so that's the whole our whole focus is this, you know how can you do you can make your own living fertilizers you can do all of these this more efficient ways that you can do everything including using chemicals and have less residues and, and all sorts of things so it's very much a pragmatic approach it's not you can't do this you can't do this there's no preaching you did what you thought you had to do if there's a better way let's look at it yeah. and that's how it works yeah it's so it's so interesting because like for someone that's not uh, um in in the um agriculture industry and you know, i'm a designer but uh, after learning about this because you grow up you know and just see what farming looks like these days you know like monocrops and yeah. what have you and, and you kind of i guess get told that that's nature and it's beautiful and things and then you get older and you get exposed to new information and you know get scared by all these chemicals well i mean the basic thing is and part of that you know the part of that need for that level of chemical intervention is the definition of the word science in Webster's Dictionary is adherence to natural laws and principles. That's what real science is. And if you say, okay, we're going to learn from nature, and what we've done is say, oh, we can do better than that. Well, no, you can't, mate. Hey, <laughs> you're, what about you're, peer reviews? You're, on your, ne you're <laughs> on your knees staring down the abyss because you had the arrogance to think you could do better than perfection. You've got a perfect blueprint. You were supposed to learn from it. And if you look at that, if you look at nature and say, okay, well, what's the central principle of nature? Very simply, it's biodiversity. The more, the merrier is how nature works. And so we, in our wisdom, said so we're going to put a monoculture in. Well, it's, you know, plants feed, every plant feeds a different group of organisms that produces glucose through photosynthesis, pumps it out of its roots and laces that glucose with certain foods that stimulate the microbes that will deliver the specific requirements of that specific plant. So the greater the diversity above ground, the greater the diversity below ground, and the greater the diversity below ground, the better everything works. 
And so monoculture is just you're feeding the same organisms, you're attacking the same bugs, the same diseases, and you bring in the same chemicals and you make those plants resistant, you put in more chemicals. And the story of chemicals just in terms of sustainability. <laughs> Degeneration right there. Yeah, it is. Exactly. And the story is quite horrific because last year was a 14.7% increase in total chemical uses globally. Increase. It was 4.4 increase, 4.4 the year before that, 4.1 the year before that, 13, 13.9, 13.6, 13.2. Okay. Every single year for 10 decades, more and more chemicals. But wait for it. Every year, without exception, more and more pest and disease pressure. I mean, it's literally the mm. definition of unsustainable, <laughs> putting more and more on for less and less response. And now the big turning point is that more and more is costing more and more. And so we see the main inputs at least doubling in price. We see, see things like urea, the most widely used form of nitrogen, has trebled in 18 months. There was a big problem with that recently, wasn't there? It's huge yeah, now. Yeah, not, yeah. Not recently, it's happening right at this yeah. moment. This, and it's, people don't realise, you know, you're a third world farmer and you're growing rice with 50 kilos of urea and it's pretty a dumbed down nutrition, but you can grow the food. It's not necessarily nutrient dense, but yeah. you will grow us enough to feed yourself, your family and make a, a meagre living yeah. from that 50 kilos. And that costs you $25, which yeah. is a small fortune for you. Well, now it costs you $75 and you haven't got $75. So there's because going to be 500 million people impacted by less food in the quite near future just from that one thing. So the, the economic system, which is kind of like laid on this farming, it just kind of, I mean, we spoke to some farmers when we went out west, you know, it's like the soil's getting less and less abundant so they're having to put more and more chemicals well they don't have to but they're, they're trained to put more and more chemicals as the solution to the problem yeah um which is the effect yeah. <laughs> um and then they're getting in more and more debt and they're getting you know they can't keep they can't get the yields they were getting without the without the chemicals no that's exactly and, how and so it's, it's, it's an economic system which yes. is that's which has been it seems by by design a it's degenerative it's, system yeah and, and just that like it just seems even, you know, we had a little conversation earlier, um, you know, before we did the podcast, but just this obsession with humans of, you know, centralising everything, like the monocrop, centralising control, you know, not embracing complexity like nature does. Yeah. And so the big dominant mantra in agriculture for many years now has been get bigger or get out, and that's that whole centralising yeah, concept. Yeah, and that has changed in everywhere now to almost not quite yet there, but we're very much heading in the direction of diversify or get out and this recognition of multi-layered mm. enterprises that sort of dovetail with each other, pretty much a permaculture concept coming into agriculture. And so people need to have 10 or 12 mm. different income streams on the farm now rather than that monoculture. Mm. And the great thing about what has turned into a phenomenon in agriculture, which is this multi-species cover cropping or cocktail cover cropping, is that that bringing in 20 species, and always trying to include five families within that 20 species, um, brings in that diversity so you can have your my apple orchard for example but the interrows will have that huge range of species so that you're bringing in that diversity yeah. and all the goodness that comes with it Back and all the protection the that comes with it what, yeah. what about the introduction of chemicals though because it wasn't uh it during the war you know no that, basically that so, so basically the whole thing started with a german chemist who burns if you take 100 kilos of crop and burn it you've got five kilos of ash and that's predominantly the minerals that grew that crop mm. And he analysed with the crude technology that was present 10 or so decades back, this is Justice von Liebig, uh, and said, well, this ash is mainly NP and K, and we've got dormant armaments factories that can make these fertilisers. So the very simple logic is that the first cell that oozed from the precambium ocean had 74 minerals, and there is no accidents in this perfect blueprint. They all do something, we'll be able to discover many of their roles. But... You know, every time you remove a crop from the field, you remove a little bit of all those things. And for a lot of years, when we had a cyclical model where animals were always involved in animal, animal manures returning, we had green manure crops, we spelled paddocks, we did all those kind of things. That was, it was still extractive, but so much less extractive than a model where we dumbed down that 74 minerals and said, well, here's three things and they'll do the job. And so people stopped doing all the manures, all the things they were doing, which was quite hard work. Uh, and they put on, they took off 74 things and put three things back on, That's probably. <laughs> That's my phone. I should have turned it off. Well, yes, certainly. Good. You're a busy man. <laughs> yeah, I should have turned it off. I didn't think. More, more people trying to get you on a podcast. <laughs> Chemicals, well, the German chemists. So oh, yeah, so, the, so, so basically, the, so what's not recognised is that when we dumbed down the nutrition, which is what it was, yeah. you know, we were 
we were recycling all sorts of minerals. Now we just take off every take off all, everything and put three things back. Well, it was only a decade to fifteen years. You can go back and look at the research when suddenly there was passion disease pressure, unlike anything anyone had seen before. It just exploded. And rather than saying is there a link to this dumbed down nutrition, which of course there was, uh, science stepped up to the plate as is often the way and said here's a whole bunch of rescue chemicals. And so we began this chemical agriculture model where we put more and more on for less and less response and we're poisoning the entire an entire generation in the process. And so we do have to start looking at something different. But weren't some of these chemicals like from the war, is that right? Or do I have that? Well, some of them have been. I mean, the, one of the nematicides is the same gas that hit the used in the, in the, in the showers. So there are right. some of those things that have been built into that model. So but when, you, when you think about that as a... Uh, as an origin story of for some of these these um, agriculture models, and then knowing the like, first of all, using it for harm, and then using the same thing in a in a um, in a agriculture setting for food, yeah. and then thinking that there's no correlation there, that there's not going to be some long term side effects. Like, how, what's your uh, how do you how does that make sense? <laughs> well, basically, it was, to you? it was just sold that you've got these problems and this is the solution, and you know that there's minimum residues, and as long as you do it safely, it's all okay, and you know, and it's not obviously immediately hugely toxic. It's just accumulative, and it can be a problem, uh-huh. and it is a problem, and it's knocking the hell out of soil life and so forth. We understand now things like the huge importance of say one creature in the soil, which is mycorrhizal fungi. So a little creature burrows into the plant root expands out and gives us 10 times the original root surface area. You can go and get moisture that is you that what the mycorrhizal fungi do, it, yeah. It it's a little like a little parasite, first. but oh. it gives far more than it takes. So yeah, it burrows okay. in, lives synergistically with the plant it's living with. It's part of that plant then on the roots. And then it just expands out and gives this huge network of tiny filaments that can get you know, minerals that are really quite immobile, like phosphorus and zinc, and it can get moisture and it produces oh, biochemicals yeah. and looks after its host. But its big claim to fame is that the most dominant of those, they are in every soil in the world, called called the glomalus strain. They produce this sticky substance mm. called glomalin, and now we understand that one sticky substance from one creature is responsible for thirty percent of all the humus in the soil. So, in this oh. climate change story, it's massive because you know why not every government come in and sponsor you to put it back in the soil. Um, because ninety percent of it's gone, it's huge. It's, it's, there's only ten percent left. It's pretty much like the fascia, right? Because like when they pull up, like when they show the the mycorrhizal fun fungi like out of the ground, right? It's like this this like crazy web of no that's not actually it's, that? it's misleading that's actually the effect of mycorrhizal fungi because uh-huh. oh, you can't yeah, okay. actually so see the, them so that okay, they yeah, stimulate yeah, the yeah. roots to get much bigger gotcha. but the, what, oh, they, okay. what they are you have to actually dye them under a microscope to even see them they're invisible to wow. the human they're eye like, they're probably quite cute they're just like this big massive <laughs> network it's just like this huge, yeah. huge network of, of uh, and you know like an amazingly important creature and not there anymore so bring it back. It's not Gosh. expensive to do it. We need to... And it holds a lot of the moisture too, is that right? Yeah, it holds moisture. It can access moisture 10 times yeah. more root surface. So all the good things the roots do, the microbes are just magnified that tenfold. So it's here. And, but the most important thing is this building of humus, this triggering of yeah. humus building in the soil from this one substance that they produce. And so we need to bring them back yesterday, you know. Mm. But the humus... Yeah, I can, I can share with you a little bit about my story of humus because I yeah. actually, like... I didn't know too much about the soil stuff. Like I've learned a little bit more since then, but I actually had like this gut issue. Like I had an infection and then I had big problems with my gut and um, ended up, you know, getting rid of the infection. But through my research, I realized that one of the most important things for your gut health is your, is your, is the humus, humic acid and fulvic acid. So that was a really big part of my journey in healing my body was through, you know, getting that into my biome and learning about the biome yeah. um and then at the same time tom was doing the uh kiss the ground course and then he's you know we kind of you know kind of had a moment where like whoa when we worked out that connection with the the humus yeah so basically yeah. On, on that vein so there's two natural acids that you make when you compost that are part of this thing called organic matter in the soil and they're called humic acid and fulvic acid yeah and you're talking about something called shilajit shilajit yeah that's yeah. what i started taking which yeah, is which, which is, is you know what that is right yes. it's like it's like um solidified uh plant matter yeah, like so thousands and thousousds of years yeah, old humic that's, and fulvic acid yeah. basically in, in an ancient form yeah and it's got all the minerals that are attached to that's that that's right so yeah and it can be and you could just take straight all humic and fulvic which is a lot cheaper than chilligit and have yeah. similar kind of results and that's wonderful for animals i mean as a supplement and basically the sort of things that both of those two natural acids do in the soil which is 
both plant growth stimulation but more importantly biological stimulation well that's what it's all about there's such a parallel between your 30-foot digestive tract with how so we thought of ourselves as, as basically a community of cells 10 trillion cells all of whom can can do everything and communicate thousands of times a second and that's who we are a sack of cells essentially physically and then we've got a whole separate thing called a soul uh, and then we had this whole awareness in the last five or ten years that we've got a tube that runs between our mouth and our anus that's got ten times more s- creatures in it than what we are, ten times more cells. It's 100 trillion cells in those, and that's 30 foot track. 100 trillion cells. Yeah, versus 10 trillion is ten times more wow. of something else. And, you know, your skin's got six billion organisms per square centimetre, and you can say, get those filthy things off there and hop into a bath of debt on morning and night in your last six days and you die because you killed your protective biofilm. We're actually a synergistic creature, yeah. a part of who we are. And what we did just, and it's very, very similar because much of what's happening in our gut where these organisms are producing a whole range of substances to look after us, their host, that same story is happening in the external mm, stomach mm. of the plant. The plant pumps its sugars um, down, 30, 30% of all the sugar it makes to, to drive itself, it gives away uh, and it feeds this army of organisms beneath its feet. And those organisms produce almost the same things that our gut organisms produce, you know, things like so A, B wild. vitamins that stimulate the plant growth and stimulate our health. And, and the list goes on. It's a hugely similar system. Mm. And we assaulted. I mean, I can walk behind you in a supermarket and quite accurately predict the health of yourself and your family based on what's on that trolley. And that's mm. just simply the, the link between gut health and every aspect of your health because the more processed food you've got in there, just under, I mean, it wasn't natural to have a football field sized stadium filled with things, food that lasts for two years, which is cornflakes or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, to do that, how did that happen? You know, food, you either salt it, you freeze it, you dry it, or it lasts a week max. So, how come it lasts two years? And so, we have a nice innocuous term called food grade stabilizers that we add in there, you know, two and a half percent sodium benzoate or whatever the stabilizer is. But what do they do? Well, they kill single celled organisms. Well, you've got a gut full of them. And why would wow. you think that as you shovel back your cornflakes that oh, that two and a half percent bug killer doesn't keep doing what it's doing? And when you compromise your life within, you compromise every aspect of your health. It affects everything yeah, your yeah. immune system, your brain is massively, they call the gut the second brain. Well, I heard recently, I was at a conference where a, a researcher was talking about manic depression and this study she was doing where basically involving something called fecal transplants where they basically nuke everything in your gut with a series of antibiotics. They find a bomb-proof person with this wonderful protective system. Often it's a familial, you know, the baby's born with a, a naked tr- digestive tract and then it has this beautiful smell coming from its head and that attracts people to cuddle it. And, and then they, you pick up the family's microbiome from that cuddling and sucking on breasts and all the rest of it and and so there's a huge link between families mm. and you find in you know, the families that live to 100 and that's the health of their microbiome so you find those people as a screening system and they pay them good money to poo i don't know how you describe your job but uh, <laughs> and then they take their poo and brew it and then they put a tube up your bottom they nuke everything you got and that's called a fecal transplant and they put this whole other person's system in there and wow, it's huge it's so a massive big thing that's underway at the moment it's like a really really effective treatment and with this manic depression study, it was over eighty percent cure of long-term manic depression just wow. by changing the gut organisms. So that, if you understand that, yeah. you, if you understand your gut determines everything, and you're pour, pouring down processed food on it, you're not going to be healthy, and you aren't. I mean, nutrition and sense. health that is just sense. simple. Yeah. Food was eat food in its whole form. There's nothing we ever did to food ever that improved it. Everything we've done is just to make more money from it, make it last longer. But all of it is a degeneration and a bastardization of the whole food. So you just eat whole food and your job's done. And the yeah. less whole food you've got in the trolley, the sicker you'll be. It's as simple as that. So interesting. Yeah. yeah, I can relate to a lot of what you're saying. Like I felt when I had that infection and my biome wasn't right. I always, keep, I always say butt guy am by mistake. So if I do that, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah. that's what I mean. Yeah. I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I felt really depressed, just yeah, no, rough for ages, yeah. and I couldn't work it out. And um, yeah, ended up, you know, getting a cyst, and then kind of getting understanding that there was this this infection, and then and but then it was a real process to reset my gut. No, it's like huge, it's not no. an easy thing to do. No, not at all. It's, it is. It took a long time to get there, and it takes a long time while to yeah. get back. Yeah, and I imagine that's you know maybe if we're looking at the macro and the micro, I imagine that's probably similar with the, with the soil, right? Yeah, it is. It's, uh, and it's very, very similar. And, you know, and so your nutrition comes down to you know, ensuring that you've got the key nutrients, the, the, nu- 
the minerals, but, but minerals are the basis of everything, yeah. but other nutrients as well. And then the microbial story, same story, minerals, microbes. Yeah. And you just told the story of the humus link for the human body because basically these two powerhouse biostimulants, which are found in Shilajit, um, they do the same thing to the soil life as they do to your gut life. They're this massive yeah. prebiotic that stimulates the hell uh-huh. out of those organisms and can bring back yeah. some gut health, as you've found. And when was the when did that penny drop for you? Like when you because obviously in your talk you make the link around human, the word human and humus and and the connection yeah. there, which is so interesting. And humility, and you everything. know, we're, wow. we're 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 an organization called Wordplay, so we love you know those kinds of connections. Yeah. Um, but when did that penny drop for you, where you where you had that realization around the the connection between soil health and human health? Well, I kind of recognised that, you know, looking at soils and so forth, that, that they weren't what they used to be, that we'd basically mined them and just extracted and not put things back, and then we killed the microbes. And so, so the understanding now of the microbial link has become so fascinating and so profound. I mean, I've always said, yeah, there's a microbe behind every mineral, because there is. There are nitrogen fixes and there are phosphate solubilizers and there are manganese-reducing organisms. But now there's a whole new body of research, which is mind-boggling, really, because we just didn't know it until recently. And it involves something called rhizophagy. It's a new discovery. Uh, So rhizo means root and phagy means eat. And so the new discovery is that plants actually literally eat microbes and half, over half of their nutrition, and this is everything in the forest and every commercial crop, half of their nutrition doesn't come from the minerals in the soil. It comes from the plant actually eating the microbes. Then they take a a very powerful oxidant, a superoxide oxidant, they dissolve the cell wall of the of the microbes that they suck up through their root ears. So the microbes now in the plant, they dissolve their cell walls and then they eat the nutrients from the microbes. Mm. And then they spit out some of the surplus microbes who don't have a cell wall anymore and they miraculously can regenerate their cell walls, but now they know what happens inside. So they look, this bloke needs this, this and this, he's got this <laughs> weakness. We look after him, he looks after us because he's feeding on a daily basis through this process of what's called quorum sen- sensing where the microbes around the roots share that information, now the plant does better by spitting out these little escapees who say, well, this is how we look after them to do better. And it's called a cycle because they keep doing wow. that. And no one even knew this stuff. And so obviously the model where you're just putting on biochemicals that kill, I mean, biocides that kill soil life, and all of them do to some degree, well, you're shooting the goose, the golden goose. It just doesn't make sense. Mm. And when you understand that, you say, oh, my God, that's right. And then you mm. start changing, you know. Oh my gosh, there's so much in that. I'm just thinking about all, all these little <laughs> thoughts, you know and thoughts in there. Like, because it's so interesting. Uh, you mentioned the word soul before, and I kind of want to um, probe a little bit deeper into that as well. But, it, but like, we're talking about first, we're full of these thousand, what did you say? A hundred trillion? Hundred trillion. trillion, yeah. hundred trillion. Organisms yeah. Yeah. that are actually us. Yeah. Like, our physical body is actually these, which I guess if you zoom into those two, it's even something else, you know, energy. Yeah. empty Horus. space whatever it is yeah. but the natural world is this is this uh cycle of of eating and getting eaten you yeah. know in the soil you know plants are actually kind of carnivorous in a way right yeah, well, they're they eating, are. yeah they're eating they're which they're is a bit eating. hard for the vegans but <laughs> <laughs> well yeah it's so interesting because I was, I, once upon a time i was vegan <laughs> it's a bit hard for the vegans full stop because when we talk at the wolf well, this is getting controversial but it's an actual fact let's go there <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we're gonna <laughs> get a, we're gonna get a low rating on this <laughs> Let's go, let's go, yeah, let's go. You just, you just gone for five stars no, down to one. Good. But <laughs> veganism, there are some question marks about it. Only, and not necessarily from a health, although it needs to be informed veganism, because I've checked, we do tests as part of our course, and we do hair tests and, and urine tests and so forth, and most vegans are B12 deficient, they're deficient in several amino acids that are much better uptaking through animal forms and things. And if you look at the closest thing to us, which is uh, a chimpanzee is 99.8% of the same genes, I mean, they're vegetarian for... 10 days and then they kill a monkey and top up all the things they have to for a day and then they go mm. back to vegetarianism mm. maybe there's a message there same teeth they're sort of related but but more importantly from a climate change perspective I had a huge argument with James Cameron the filmmaker he'd invited me to his Christmas party because I know his wife Susie she runs it's a James really Cameron nice Avatar. Is that? Oh, um, Avatar. Titanic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not a big movie buff, but no, yes, please. No, well, he's just <laughs> Avatar. Tom falls Ava- asleep Avatar movies. 2 just came out this week, so it's big news. <laughs> Biggest grossing movie of all We're time. We're going to catch up on Avatar 1. Avatar so good. They've bought it. Him and his wife are a bit full-on vegan, so we had this big argument about the link between you know that veganism and climate change because they think they're doing the right thing, closing down all this beautiful grazing soil on the 3,000-acre farm they've bought and growing chickpeas and whatever. 
Um, nothing wrong with that, but, all, but what I'm arguing is that the findings now, when we look at how we can build humans, so first thing to understand with this human story is simply there's only the same carbon molecules that have ever been here since the start of time. You can't make new stuff. You can't look at your soil test and say, oh, I went from 2% to 3%. I made 1%. Can't, no, you can't make it. It's the same molecules. That, what, that's what makes us all as one. You can't say mm. we're not all as one because mm. we were all some other carbon-based life form at some point. That's what dust to dust in the Bible is about. It's all interrelated. Um, and from that perspective, I'll just have a mouthful of beer. That's all right. <laughs> and in some sustenance. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not, what, not one of the healthiest things, but it tastes bloody good. <laughs> <laughs> I have that, that, you know, that trouble every day. But, yeah. So now I've lost where I was. So what was I talking about? Um, Chickpeas. Um, oh, yeah so, right? yeah. so the argument basically is that now there's a lot of research on how we can build humus. And so the story is that, so it's a carbon cycle. The soils, the carbon is stored in the soil, and that can be an inorganic, like calcium carbonate, for example. You can hear the word carbon in there. But largest storehouse on the planet is organic matter or humus. Is by far it's you know double what anything else. Then there's carbon-based life forms, you know, humans, plants, animals, and then it can become the gaseous form. And the largest storehouse, as we said, is organic matter. And we've gone from five percent down to one point five percent globally, organic matter, and that's four hundred seventy-six gigatons. And since 1860, we put 250 gigatons up from coal and oil and industry and motor vehicles and everything. So double what's gone up in there, thickening the blanket, trapping the heat and changing the world. Double this came from the soil compared to almost, slightly less than, but almost double compared to everything else we've done. And the fastest way to change it is that when you build carbon, when you change the way you're farming, which is a carbon losing model, um, and you start building carbon by changing, and sometimes quite small things in how you farm, um, that building of carbon is just you stepping into the carbon cycle and sequestering what otherwise would be in the atmosphere and it's direct carbon sequestration and it's the fastest way that mm. we can save the mm. day it's hugely important mm. i mean if you sit down with a calculator and say okay 100 square meters of garden and i'm going to take that and i'm going to do some compost i'm going to do a cover crop or whatever uh, and maybe stimulate some biology or whatever and i'm going to put some microbes of fungi in there for example and i'm going to d- double my organic matter your contribution as one cog in the wheel is more profound than putting on solar or worrying about well, not that those things aren't good but it's much much bigger contribution yeah. when you start come my little 100 square meters and then there's 7.8 billion other 100 square meters and what does that accumulate and that's planet saving so it's the biggest single contribution you can do is to actually do that thing and understand that and then as i've said on the ted talk you know if you can't do it yourself well you, you, you support those that can you vote with your wallet and you go to markets and you choose yeah. put a face to your food and choose people that are doing the right thing that are producing the f- food in the right way that is helping save the day sort of thing so mm. that's that's you know, yeah yeah how it works and so the model with animals in that equation is that if we're going to use um that definition of science as adherence to greatest to, ad- ad- adherence to natural laws and principles then we say okay what was the most productive area ever in the history of mankind and the most productive area that produced more biomass more humus more everything for tens of thousands of years were the great plains in the u.s now nothing came close to them which became and nothing, the dust bowl right no, yeah, yeah. yeah. In 60 years which, we, which we, what the dust bowl like, yeah, oh, we, the so dust we turned bowl, it from okay. the most productive area ever you know you had this herd of bison with indians yeah. and, oh, uh, wow. and wolves on either side Deep so you weren't choosing about what you ate and massive amounts of dung and urine which is of course the biostimulant you trample down uh, some of what you're standing on and that mob effect and that now is broken off, and so that that's, that's now can be digested into humus, and all that biostimulation digests it. But the thing to learn, because we're learning from nature, that's what science is, was that they never graze below four inches. Um, we're talking inches because it's yeah, four right. inches in that model. And so basically, the model, the thing's quite simple. You can walk out into a field. There's a foot of organic matter. There's mm. thirty centimeters of organic matter. You get a spade and you dig down and there'll be 30 centimetres of core root structure because 30 centimetres above ground, which is pumping down the sugars and feeding the roots, sustains 30 centimetres below ground. If you cut to 20 centimetres, the roots prune themselves to 20 centimetres because 20 centimetres above that solar panel producing the sugars and pumping yeah. them down can't sustain any more than 20 centimetres. Gotcha. If you graze, you know, you cut it down to two inches, the roots prune themselves to two inches, you take it to an inch, you take it to the table cock because your dad said you've got to take it to the dirt boy, you missed it. You've just gone back to nothing. There's no solar panel. There's no driving force. You just got your back on your back haunches, rearing up, trying to get some kind of start again. Yeah. And it's just plain stupid. And so the mob grazing effect, the use of animals, 
particularly if you bring in what's called multi-species pasture cropping, where you direct drill other species and you increase photosynthetic density, and you bring animals in for a short time, large numbers for a day, and then move them, never graze below four inches, that's the fastest humus yeah. building strategy on the planet. By far, there's nothing close to it. Interesting. And animals literally, there is no debate, there's so much research on it, animals are the biggest tool we've got to save the planet. And someone's got to eat Which them. Which is a complete... <laughs> You know, that's like, the reality. Someone's got to eat them or we don't have them. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's almost you're doing a palliative service to eat animals. Yeah. And, that, and, you know, the argument that they're m- horrifically inhumanely treated is completely valid. But most of the farmers we deal with absolutely love every every animal they've got. They'll die for their animals. Yeah. Mm. And that's the reality. We're not talking about feedlot horror, factory horror farming, houses and factory yeah. farming. That's no. got to go. But the idea of animals and their intelligent grazing model is massively important. Because, like, how does that play out? Like, because we, we spent a bit of time out west, right, on the, the Darling River there, and um, we went out on this bus with Uncle Bruce Shillingsworth and he took us out there on this trip down the Darling. And I don't know if you've been out there at all, if you've had much to do with, with anything out there, but, you know, Australia, like, obviously there's a big water, you know, crisis. We're living on the driest inhabited continent on Earth. Yeah. And before going out there... I was really bought into this drought story, and we know there's there is a drought, but the narrative around why there is a drought, you know, I, the the idea that I'd been sold um, through schooling and everything is is very different to what I realised when I went out there, and that in fact they dried up an ecosystem, they've stolen the water out of the river, they've dried up this whole system, so there's no water left. So then, really, there is a drought, but it's not because of climate change. Well, it is no. climate change, but it's not because of carbon. Is from it's else, because yeah. they've taken the water that's and mis- now there's that's mismanagement. Yeah, yeah that's right. So it's like, and and there was a bit in there around the 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 um, animal stuff too, because you know they took cattle out there and then the cattle's teeth chewed down a bit and then they they couldn't chew any further. So then they brew the, they bring in the sheep and then they chew down and then they bring the goats in because they can chew a bit further. Yeah. So then you end up with this like soil this issue with the soil, right? Um, so th- I guess there's two questions in there. Maybe I need to break them up. But the first one is around maybe maybe on the livestock and then I'll go back to the other one. But like, yeah, in that instance, you know, that's they had livestock out there and it's it, it seems like it's a mismanagement, you know, issue. Or is that the climate that's out there that the soil is? No, because basically you can bring animals into any scenario. I've got yeah. a friend in South Africa who... Um, up in the Drakensberg, up in the mountains, there's this, this area called the Veld, which is considered to be kind of this quite a quite precious place that's been, you know, theoretically destroyed completely by mismanagement of animals, yeah. bringing them in where they shouldn't be and at the wrong times and so forth, and grazing them much too harshly and so forth. But the founder of the cell grazing model wasn't Alan Savory, and it wasn't. It was actually a South African botanist, and this guy who owns this um, Dick I said it was, but now his son Kevin runs it. Um, this farm was, uh, he learnt from this guy that taught the other masters in that field of this wholesale grazing model, this, this potential of that model. And he adopted all of those principles and it's, you know, it's considered a national treasure. They've just brought back everything and this is using animals to repair landscape and it's just, yeah. it's very much a science in how you do that. But the very simple thing in a commercial model is you just don't graze below four inches, however you do that. So you bring them into large numbers for a small time and have had to get that mob effect. Uh, and then move them on and let, let it regenerate fully and then they bring mm. them back in again and so you have the cycling model that and then that model I mean people like Christine Jones who's a wonderful soil scientist has demonstrated that's the fastest and most efficient way that you can build humus you're not disturbing the soil yeah, so yeah. the fungi that build stable humus are at work you've got good legume component they feed the fungi then you create the stable humus that lasts for 35 years that you're building uh, and it's just it's the fastest and best way yeah. we can do it. Because one of the arguments that I heard out there as well was around the the foot, the feet of the yeah. ca- cattle, and how they destroy destroy the Terrible soil and de- yeah. and destroy the waterways. What well, what do you reckon well, about that? Well, basically, again, it's it's how you're grazing them and how that works. But the bigger part of that story, because the whole story on why you know we just went, I got a bit of a mobile home to do these seminar tours, um, and. We drove 7,000 k's recently and I mean, it was during, I mean, it's been flooding everywhere for so long, but the rivers are just running brown. It's just, you know, That's we're right. losing 7 to 12 tonnes of topsoil per, per hectare per year currently 
and some of the some of the leading scientists have now told us that we've got 55 years left and there's nothing so it's a huge huge issue and the question is why are we losing so much soil well, that comes back to this thing called humus because humus is the glue that holds us all together we lost two-thirds of it uh, then we won't have any soil structure because if you've got humus in your soil you've got the sponge effect that bounces back and you've got this you, yeah. when you get rain one of the most important words in agriculture in the brave new world as i mentioned of of climate change agriculture is this this thing called infiltration when you get rainfall how quickly do you infiltrate that rainfall rather than just washing the topsoil off into the river yeah. and out in the ocean yeah. uh, and that's all about humus and biology creating this open breathing soil that can suck moisture in i mean there are many growers who had you can yeah. do what's you can do an infiltration test there's a whole way you do it you put on the equivalent of one inch into this with your soil into a container and you see what comes comes through and so forth uh, and how, much, how fast it sucks into that soil and how much comes out the bottom and so forth. It's just a little machine you can get now to test infiltration. Many people had sort of half an inch in an hour infiltration capacity and they've gone up to eight inches an hour. And that's yeah. huge. You don't, you don't wash it off into the rivers. You suck it up, store it. The humus is yeah. the sponge that holds that water and the plant takes it as it needs. It's like the ultimate water amount. What is the new gold? This war has been fought as we speak over it, even though we've got a false sense yeah. of security because of a couple of years of rain, we will go back into drought and water's massive. And when we look at our water management strategy, huge open bodies of water back, you know, it seems like back in the day, but two years back, when the whole eastern seaboard had 40 degrees for 10 straight days, there's trillions of litres of evaporation. It's really, really impractical, that model. And then you pump it with a carbon footprint, sometimes a couple of hundred k's away to our farm. Then you put it through centre pivots or flood irrigate, which very few people in the world are still doing, but we are with massive evaporation Huge. when you do that. Yeah. It's really, really inefficient management. But comparing that 1% organic matter, you increase from 2 to 3%, which is quite easy, doable in a year even, um, that means you can hold 170,000 litres per hectare. So this table is a square metre, two large buckets, 17 litres in a square metre, that's held beneath the soil in that sponge on the plant. There's no yeah. evaporation, there's no carbon footprint, the plant just takes it as it needs it. Yeah. It's like the ultimate water management strategy. And we've lost that. And, and when we lose soil structure, then those animals, particularly if they're mismanaged and they're grazing, will, will compact and further wreck yeah. those soils because there's no bounce back capacity in the soils, there's no humus, there's no that's biology. That's it, hey, and that's the thing. It's like this looking at things like a system rather than looking at these symptoms. Mm. Um, and that's, that's something else that, that's quite interesting around that, you know, and that was leading into my other question was around this climate crisis and how the information can be used to kind of manipulate an agenda or like to to because it kind of worries me in a in a sense that we understand that we're in a crisis and and you and you you see this example of this um of this drought story right like we think there's a drought but really you know and we're and we're being really pushed this this um global warming thing and and i understand there's elements you know there's truth there but it's just around the narrative sometimes i'm, I'm kind of worried about how they're using it and what the agenda is and where they're kind of funneling us with it because um sorry i've lost my train of thought there but the but the but the drought yeah so that there when you go out to the darling you see that it's because they're selling water and they're using this thing as like a stock exchange right yeah and that's a big problem and that's really what's going on but they're not going to talk about that it's a lot of money to be made but even just in what you're saying there like their 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 um justification for emptying menindi lakes which is a natural lake yeah um, which is huge. I think it's the size of like Sydney or something no, like it's, that. It? It's like six. Oh, it's like sixteen k's wide. I think. Okay. Just okay. the the, so the, the big one, and then there's many of them. Okay. Around, there's yeah. many. There's like seven yeah, lakes it's a whole or something. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing place. It was apparently. Yes, yeah. You've been out there. Yeah. Thought, Beautiful. Like, it's like apparently that's like the breeding ground of like most fish in the yeah, world and, and like birds, bird life birds and things like that. Yeah. Amazing. Um, but yeah, one of the justifications that they had for. Um, removing the water from the lakes was because of the evaporation. Yeah. So it's like there's a thing like, you know, we're talking about efficiency and doing more with less and being careful with our resources. But then also sometimes these things can be used, these same justifications can be used for like, okay, we're going to empty a whole ecosystem because of the surface level. And you will, I don't know if you went out there, when did you see the device they used to measure the evaporation? So they have this like little metal drum or something in the middle of this concrete slab with water in it and then mm. they they have all these measuring instruments on it and that's how they are measuring yeah. the the evaporation rate 
for this lake, but obviously they're not accounting for like the ecosystem and how no. it works all together and the things that you're talking about. Like and the, the lake doesn't sit on a concrete uh, slab. <laughs> no, uh, so it's <laughs> like that's the thing. It's no. like we know that this stuff is going on. We know that there's truth in the climate crisis and we also know there's a lot of bullshit. And like in this this world that we live in with so much media – it's so easy to manipulate the truth and, 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 and it's very sometimes very difficult. Well, actually, you can get to the truth if you, well, do a bit of research. Very difficult. Cause but, so yes, there's just yeah. so, many, so many perspectives out there and it's like, you know, how do you see, how do you see this playing out? And, and, um, I mean, there, there is the first thing is from, you know, there's still climate change deniers out there and the most compelling evidence contrary to that denial is just simply ice core sampling so basically with ice core sampling you're, you're measuring the the ice captures the gases that were present at the ice the time the ice was formed so you drill down they've gone back seven hundred thousand years and so we know what happened and so people who argue oh it's cyclical well they're right and what we found is that every hundred thousand years all three greenhouse gases you know methane carbon dioxide nitrous oxide all rise perfectly in sync and peak and the climate changes sometimes quite dramatically every hundred thousand years and then it falls away and we weren't here seven hundred thousand years ago in any numbers to be contributing so it is cyclical and then it rises again and we're currently at, at in one of those rises but what we do know is exactly how many parts per million of co2 was present at the at every peak and every time we peaked at 280 parts per million this time it's 402 parts per million and that's since 1950 basically you know it's really simple i mean it took us to until 1900 to get our first billion and then 1949 we hit two billion so we doubled up you know it took hundreds of thousands of years to get the first and then in 50 years we doubled and then we've gone from you know in 72 years we've gone from two billion to 7.8 billion uh, and that's huge explosion in human enterprise has been funded by by ancient sunlight basically by coal and oil uh, and that what was in the soils now in the atmosphere, and that's 250 gigatons since 1860. But our mismanagement of our soils has almost double that. So the combination of the two has created this thicker blanket. And, and while it's only 1.2 degrees so far, it's heading towards, you know, a horrific scenario of where we're heading. There's no debating that it's happening, and there's no debating it's our contribution. What you're talking about. Uh, is humans stepping in with all of the horrible things that humans do and and really manipulating that whole scenario for whatever vested interests want to achieve whatever they want to do and that is happening and yeah. will happen and it's just we just got to because like yeah. the solutions that are being presented to us you know like what you're talking about makes so much sense it's a systemic approach we're looking yep. at things we're looking at things as a system but like you said you know like the common thing to do is okay well here's the cause the problem yeah let's you know just put more here's another thing to treat the symptom yeah. get more chemicals more this more that you know there's so many solutions to this problem with the um you know with energy and, and climate and everything and this what's the what's the you know what's the right avenue to take and and how do we ensure like because i don't i personally don't trust the, the, the people that are making the decisions like I think they're making some very bad decisions I think there's some very good people working on this all around the world and and I think there's a lot of people with very good intentions but I think things are very slow moving and I'm, I'm I don't really trust that the decisions they're making are are, are for the best or, or maybe are not um you know in in line with kind of what you're talking about here with the with the soil I mean there are just how, how do we ensure that how do we how do we make sure as as humanity that we that we you know, own this, and we and we take take charge. Well, I think right the, you know, like my approach with sharing everything that I've accumulated, and I just share openly. I tell people how I formulate everything I ever developed. I tell everyone everything, yeah. and I encourage every farmer to do the same. So we talked earlier about open sourcing and the importance of it at this yeah, point of time because yeah. it really is. It does come down to the you can't pull the wool over people's eyes. There are the alternatives yeah. that are there out there for everyone to see and everyone to utilize. And so there's a lot of positives that can come from that. And we've really got to sort of sidestep the um, the money men and the corporations and so forth that are intent on you know lining their own pockets or lining their shareholders' pockets or whatever the deal is. And and I think that that's changing. You know, yeah. I'm actually quite positive. I think yeah. our human initiative when we're up against the wall can be amazing. And now that we've got things opening up, um, that we will actually save the day. Yeah. And there'll be all sorts of things come to the fore that will make things so much different. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Well, the, the, like I was just reflecting on this the other day, and I reflect on it all the time, you know, but um, 
I was just at the Tweed uh, Regional Museum here, yeah. and there's this uh, awesome exhibition on on in there, a permanent one around the you know the natural ecosystem here in the Tweed, and a lot of the um, indigenous lore and stories of the of the area. And like, for instance, and this is not just common to the Tweed. This is across the world. Like we're saying, it's like there's been like. 3,000 or some, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a memory like yours, Graham. Yeah, you're just like with the stats. The numbers <laughs> but a massive amount of, uh, of species uh, have been Already gone, gone yeah. uh, in the last like 100, 200 years. And they're continuing to go, whether that, and that's probably not even including all the things that would have been in the soil and the little tiny things. They're probably just talking about the bigger animals that, you know, people can re remember and things. And you're talking about, um, diversity being the solution you know with the soil and, and with life in general you know the more life we have the more resilient we become but you know there's this whole thing with the climate changing and it's and and again going to the narrative it's like oh because of fossil fuels which is obviously a big part of it but then there's yeah. also like this huge thing about just like wiping out all the diversity on the earth and uh and you know the forests yeah. and so many different things and, and with the food and then there's this whole thing with the new food that they call this um lab grown food that's coming next as part of the the um, solution. environmental solution, right? Yeah. Which veganism, which, which isn't, which isn't, which doesn't have diversity at its core. That's got more of its monocropping no, it's exactly. sort of situation. So it's like this really wild scenario that we're we're in right now. Particularly, it just seems like it's just kind of emerged in the last couple of years, and into, you know, in the next few years, this is going to be a big transition uh, with this whole whole system. Um, but it does feel like there's this sort of fork where it's like there's the re path of regeneration and and more diversity but then there's still like included in the solution this sort of new version of monocropping and Control, segregation centralization, <laughs> centralization controlling the food system as, in the yeah. same breath as as a solution and set and you know electric vehicles and all these things are going to save us but it's like well electric vehicles are great um but if we don't have an environment what's the point right. of that and they're, they're coal powered right now really aren't they well, yeah, they're like nothing, nothing's, um, you know, it all, it still all, all requires the something. System, the system yeah. needs yeah. to be addressed, yeah. So, yeah, do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if it comes, the bottom line comes back to the natural side of it because none of it exists without it. Mm. And that's the recognition that you, I mean, the microbial story, I mean, you know, understanding that model is kind of ludicrous because um, we understand so little, you know, we've got people like, Elon Musk, who's kind of like the Henry Ford of this century with us, although he's doing some rather silly things at the moment with, with Twitter and things, but he has been an amazing kind of entrepreneur, opening all sorts of things and all sorts of possibilities. But, you know, his boyhood deal is I'm going to spend trillions and build some kind of bubble that a few elites can live on on some rat hole red desert planet called Mars where we've got this beautiful, <laughs> incredible, wondrous place, this pearl right. of a place that we live on, and we know nothing about it. If you look at the soil, for example, you know, nematodes, people think, well, root knot nematodes are the most destructive of all, and they are. 20% um, of them, nematodes on the, on, the, on, the, on the planet are bad guys, but 80% of them have got all sorts of roles. And we understand um, 20,000 of them. Ne nematologists have named 20,000 different nematodes, but there's a thing called DNA analysis, which identifies completely different life forms. And we know there's more than a million of them. There's one species. There's a more than a million different types of 980,000. We don't even know what they do. We kill them all with a nematocide but we have no idea of what their role is. It's so little that we understand. And now we're understanding, you know, basically in the plant model, of course, all the story about the human microbiome, but in the plant model, you've got the rhizosphere, so you've got all the organisms crowded uh, around that root because the plant's feeding 30% of its total glucose that it produces, it feeds from its roots. It's, it's interesting because the most important process on the planet by far is this thing called photosynthesis. That's where water, sunlight and CO2 are combined in this almost miraculous process to create the building block of everything. That's where you came from. Glucose is a building block of all carbon-based life forms. Mm. In conjunction with minerals, glucose builds all carbon. So that's where it all comes from initially. So the plant uses glucose with minerals for everything, including its resilience and its growth and its flowering and its seeding and so forth. But it pumps out, it pumps half of its sugars down to the roots each night and 60% of that half it pumps out from its roots. So it's giving away its most precious substance. And there at the nexus, you know, because the organisms are all waiting open mouth to get their daily feed, uh, and there at the nexus of the most important process on the planet is the most important principle, and it arguably is, and that principle is give and you shall receive. And what's fascinating, even in my latest podcast where I have a whole human health segment, and this time I had a focus upon some new studies into longevity, and everyone sort of perhaps understands that, 
you know, getting that extra 10 or 15 years is about informed nutrition, it's about, it's about diet and it's about exercise. And, but then a study comes out that something actually overwhelms all of those and that was a real surprise. Volunteering is actually more likely to give you that extra 10 to 15 years than anything else and that's give and you shall receive. You that's can't get what you can't give. That's how life works. Mm. And there it is at the nexus of the most important process on the planet. But anyway, so the plant's feeding this, the soil life that fixes nitrogen, solubilizes phosphorus, protects from disease, makes humus and all the things that microbes do. And then it has a whole leaf there. So now we've got something called the phylosphere, which is the leaf surface, and the plant pumps out carbon into the leaf and feeds this army of organisms on the leaf who fix nitrogen from the atmosphere directly into the leaf to feed the plant and protect from disease and so forth. And then we have this more, more recent discovery that the seed itself, it's called the endosphere, it's filled with all these probiotic microbes that are really good for us, but are really good mm. to get the plant kick-started and protected. And then when we treat seeds and so forth, as we've done in commercial, uh, you know, in industrial agriculture, many of those are killed. So we don't have that kick-started. And so we bring in GM things and all this nonsense. But even, you know, I grow apples and apples are in a wonderful, wonderful food if they don't have the chemicals. Um, but the study out of Austria this year, the apple seed actually has 100 million probiotic organisms in the seed. And people think, oh, I'm not eating apple seeds because that's cyanide. Well, it's not. You've got to eat 40 apples to have anything, any toxic effect from them. Apple, the apple core in the seed, the, within the core in the seed, there are two antioxidants, one of them being chlorogenic acid, which is the big antioxidant in coffee, that you don't get anywhere else, but the, you want to chew the whole thing when you eat it. But, but what they discovered was that conventionally grown apples, zero microorganisms oh. in the seed. Because the, the, the systemic insecticides and fungicides they're using kill everything inside, inside the seed even. Mm. But organic apples have got this massive army of organisms that are wonderful to eat, wonderful for us. And are there, of course, to kickstart the new plant. So you've got this whole awakening as to, you know, really microbes are driving yeah. everything. Uh, and all we've got to hope is that they don't start genetically modifying and messing with that system, which, of course, they're trying to do everywhere. Which they are, <laughs> yeah. really, aren't they? Yeah, they are, unfortunately. Yeah, you hear um, Vandana Shiva talk about it. She's saying if you, I don't know if you've heard of her, but yeah, she, no, she's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, not work. a not a big fan of Gatesy, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, she's saying that if they if you control the seeds, you control society. Which is very much what's yeah, been done. Yeah. yeah. So it's a big it's a big job, you know. It's probably it's going to probably take many hands and and a lot of education to to put us on track with this. Um, but you seem quite positive about it. Yeah, there's an so, awakening. Yeah. Everywhere you go, there's, the people are just saying, well, this is what we've got to do. This yeah. is the shape of the future. There's not going to be much of one. Yeah. It's just as basic as that. So uh, can, can, you, can you talk to us about that? So, so what kind of things are happening out there and, you know, you know keeping you positive? Like what, what are some well, of the change that you're seeing? Well, I mean, I've been lecturing people like um, the Dole Corporation. They're the largest, have called themselves the largest food producers on the planet. I've been having courses for them. I've had courses for Green Yard Farms are actually bigger than Dole. They're 6.8 billion compared to 6.5. And, you know, the managing director, the owner of that company said, well, we all understand that this is pretty much, you know, that story of being the shape of the future. But all of our agronomists and all of our farm managers are chemically trained and we need a credible evangelist to sort of try and start switching that and hence, you know, doing some work with them. But, um, you know, there's people like Just Berries who organic divisions out yielding the conventional when they're huge, they're the largest organic producers. So there's this whole recognition now and this awakening as to the mechanics of producing good quality food without chemicals but without loss, without sacrifice. And then, then of course, there's this whole emerging model where you're going to get paid carbon credits and it's a huge of course all the middlemen have jumped in now and, and are wanting their slice of the action and they, and they say we'll pay for the benchmarking of your carbon on your soil but then we get 25% of the end product and the 20 year contract mm. you sign and that can be millions um, so there's that whole thing that humans do and they try and grab some of that slice of the action but the bottom line is it's a good model that you're actually going to get paid for the very thing that's going to make the planet last longer you more sustainable because when we look at the National Bank study from several years ago saying why, what makes you profitable in agriculture, you know, uh, we've got a current model where everyone wants to buy their neighbour's farm, it's the get bigger or get out model, and they come in and we tick the boxes, do you qualify for this loan? And they do in, in many cases, and we give them the loan, and then an unacceptable percentage of those loans are falling over. So we go back uh, and let's finance the study of looking at what determines profitability. So in the Hilston region of New South Wales, on I think 800 farms for three years, they looked at everything. Is it the amount of MPK, the amount of chemicals, 
Um, Sorry, what's the NPK? Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Oh, the three, NPK, the NPK. simplistic okay. fertilizers that people okay, use. Gotcha. Is it? Is it? You know how much fertilizer you put on? Is it um, the size of your tractor? Your marketing skills? Your accounting skills? I mean, any of those things can determine your profitability. And to the absolute surprise of the researchers, the chief determinant of profitability was the percentage of organic matter you had in your soil. Wow. And so, you know, we're, we're, looking, we're looking at the golden era of agriculture, in my opinion, because we're looking at a period where you're actually going to get paid to increase the very thing that increases your profitability and your likelihood of survival. And the kind of things that do it, you can't do that from a bag. You've got to do sustainable things to make that work. Mm. So the whole thing is on the right path. And it's happening at a hell of a speed all over the planet. So it's really, really positive from that perspective. Yeah, it's really interesting. I've been I've been actually studying with um I've been studying the Systems Leader Academy with this organization called the Valley Web and they actually facilitate at the World Economic Forum. They 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 design and facilitate the events, right? Yeah. And um on one of the calls they had this lady come on and her name was um, Lisa Dreyer. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of her. Um, but she had a lot to do with designing the agriculture system, so the world's agriculture system. Wow. Very yeah. interesting. Like I would love to talk to her more actually and, and, and understand if there was any, you know, conversations with people like yourself around regen and, and soil health because um, I did, yeah, I did – because they had like a little video that, they, that we could watch on the process and the vision of the agriculture system was actually set by 17 corporations – yeah. So, you know, that in itself, which I, I find, well, if the vision's set and then they're working on the vision, that the vision's already set, you know, so it's like how do you navigate? And, I mean, to, well. to to her testament, well. I imagine it would have been very, like how do you even engage, you know, this the, the stakeholders that you need to engage in such a huge undertaking as designing the world's food system when there's so many stakeholders from so many vantage points. Squillions even. Billions, trillions. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) squillions. I don't even know what the number would be called. But like what an undertaking and like, yeah, so I had a lot of questions around that, you know, in in terms of how that happened and and who, who has those conversations and you know, is that happening elsewhere? You know, that's obviously ha- – those conversations like that are happening at the World Economic Forum. And, like, I'm zooming in on these whiteboards and I'm looking at it and it's like in- – it's all about – like, what I could see was all about increase, you know, increase, increase. Like, and, you know, is that real? Is that realistic? Are we designing a food system about increase or is it about – what are the what are the design principles? Is it around a healthy civilization, or is it about increase and profitability? And it's well, like, well, part know. of that model is, has been, and that's really been the driver of uh, things like the genetic, genetically modified thing. That's you know the Roundup Ready um, cotton or, or corn or soy or whatever. Uh, part of that model has been that we've got to feed these potential ten billion people. And yeah. what the the myth that is nonsense. You know, the first thing to understand is that that's absolute nonsense. And on a very very small scale, as an example of that. I was doing um, this, these talks I do for this regenerative group up in Rockhampton, Broadacre Farmers. We couldn't get our normal CWA hall where we do our talks because they, they were having a meeting there. So we went down to the coast instead of inland uh, to a permaculture teacher who just happened to be part of the group even though he's not a Broadacre farmer. Uh, and he had this teaching institute on top of a hill. And so he had this um, horrific block of soil. You know, you can drive from here to Cairns and you're thinking, like when I came over from New Zealand many years back, I thought, oh, I'm going into the tropics. And then you're just driving through the scrub and gravel and dirt and there's not even a kangaroo. There's nothing for hundreds and hundreds. I don't even know who owns that land, but it's completely unproductive and dry as a bone and horrible looking stuff. Um, that's what his soil was like. It actually housed, the 20 acres housed one goat. Uh, and so then he set up the, this permaculture principle. Well, permaculture actually... They sort of stole and they didn't really give the credit they should have. They stole something from a guy called P.K. Yeomans, this, this concept of, um, of contour farming, and they call it swales, but it doesn't matter where they got it from. The bottom line is that water follows uh, the contours, and you, in, this, in their case they dig a drain on the contours and they lead the water around their farm. So then the dirt from the drain becomes the bank that you plant on, and the drain holds the water and feeds the bank and irrigates that bank. So, so this guy does this on his farm on this huge hillside, so right down to the bottom there's just row after row of these of these beds that he's built and then another twenty feet down another twenty metres down or ten metres down there's another one and the drain on the inside's collecting every bit of water that falls. 
Uh, and then he's he's just got, so this is still clay and gravel. In fact, it's even worse because you've dug a drain. That's even there's no topsoil. It's just garbage that you could never grow anything on. And then he's taken a combine harvester and harvested um, the bottom of his place and a couple of absentee neighbours who said, "Yeah, you can slash my place for free. That's great." And then he's taken all their grass and so he's put this much grass. He's got cardboard from Harvey Norman's truckload of it and laid that on all the beds. And then he's put this much grass on top of it. And then he's got a little compost heap on the top of the hill. And everything that he plants, and it's multi-species. I mean, there's every kind of fruit and every kind of vegetable and herb and every and, and things like lucerne that you can cut and drop and it becomes part of the mulch and other legumes that you can do that with. It's a real permaculture model of that diversity. Uh, and then he's got a brewing tank up the top and he gravity feeds down microbes on top of that. And he's got a, he's got a backpack sprayer and he sprays the nutrients that are required, does a leaf test, sees what's needed. So he does all the things that we teach in nutrition farming within a permaculture model. And... That farm that produced one goat uh, is, is feeding, I think, like 40 families from a boxed model. of, uh, And so this is on the worst soil you could ever find on the planet, and it's just this insanely productive soil. And th- you, we could feed 100 billion people with our eyes closed. That's what the possibility mm. is. And the nonsense is saying we've got to transform everything and have this really unproven problem technology of genetically modifying things and, and changing that whole model. Uh, because we can't, we don't feed people. That's just yeah. rubbish. That's I think I think your mate Elon was offering a bit of cash to solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> Hit him yeah. up, maybe. <laughs> yeah. But it's um, yeah. The reality is that we could. That's that's it's really easy. Well, that's to, that's very optimistic too. Yeah. Like you're talking about optimism, but then the meat again, like that. What we're getting fed is kind of like fear about not being able to feed our families and ourselves in the you know, ne- in the near future when actually what there's so much abundance um, there's so yeah, much abundance it's just, you know nature like, is just so wonderfully abundant you know and it's just knowing how to look after it and we haven't been we've been riding rough shot over it and we yeah. just got to say okay we look after it it looks after us and that's how it works what do you see as like if if everything was perfect like if if we lived in this really abundant world that was you know full of microbes and the Soil was incredible. You know, like what, what, what kind of civilization could we have? You know, if we really looked after the soil, what could we, what could we? Well, create? I mean, you know, the problem, the problems that we see, um, the behavioural problems, and they're horrific and they're growing. Um, there's been some really simple studies. There's a woman, actually, Jamie Oliver had a program called School Lunches where. Um, he basically looked at a school, you know, and then that and, and that model of the government pays for your lunch. So I looked at the school, and the lunch consisted of some chicken nuggets and chips or some whatever that you chucked in a deep fryer. That's all it was. Um, and he said, "Well, the government's paying for this. What would happen if we changed that model and we gave them, you know, chicken stir fry with all fresh vegetables and everything stir fried?" And it had a huge issue. It was a school of four thousand. They actually went to a hospital to service those kids, and they found this doctor who said, "Well, we have kids that come in here regularly." that are so constipated they're actually coughing up poo, which you can do because it can go down one side and come up the other side. You can actually be that constipated oh, that you can cough what? it up because they've got no fibre at all. That's Zero <laughs> fibre in their diets. It's just literally. And so he had all sorts of problems trying to get that system underway. Even the tuck oh. shop lady said, we don't want to chop up all this stuff. We just have to pour you know, deep fried st- and stuff in the deep fried. Seed oil ain't great for the biome, is it? Uh, no, no, it's terrible. And so so, so basically gradually, and some of the kids vomited when they ate vegetables. They'd never eaten them before. And, so, and then he had to lock the gates because they tried oh to get out the white junk food and the appearance of chucking them Kentucky fried over the wall and so forth. Oh, no. oh, but God. at the end of that, that's why, <laughs> and the end of that, it was a marriage almost broke up. It was a hell of a thing for him when he went through it. But at the end of that time, um, there were a whole bunch of changes that happened that we were unanticipated. He just thought it would be good to get some food. And the big ones were behavioural changes. It was just insane. In fact, and, and the health changes were profound. There was one woman who was part time, you know, 4,000 kids. Uh, and she was handing out the antidepressants, which is 10% of boys and 9% of girls are on antidepressants. Uh, and then another one hand was, you're not even allowed to do your a- asthma puffers. She was doing the asthma puffers, and the other one was doing um, ADD medication, Ritalin, which is 11% of boys, 10% of girls. So, you know, that's 400 kids that have got to have it, and that was their job. Well, they lost their jobs. It changed that much just by changing the nature of the mm. food. But that was copied, as many things are, everyone stands on someone's shoulders, from Barbara, that... Walters or whatever, she's a, and she's a, she was working in the penal system and she said, okay, here's um, these prisoners who you know, have had horrific diets and things, could diet be linked? So she just set this thing where they took out all the junk food machines, all the Coke machines out of the prison. She taught them how to grow their own food. They, she actually, her and her husband owned a company called Whole Food Bakeries and they would supply some of the food within the budget for the good quality whole foods into that system. 
And their model to monitor it was the level of recidivism. You know, how many people reoffend? Well, it's a horrifically unsuccessful model, and most people reoffend. And they had the lowest levels of recidivism ever measured anywhere on the planet in the history of penal colonies or penal institutions. Mm. So then she took that to a school very similar to Jamie, and that's where Jamie got his ideas from. And this school had, had two ropes, and you had to go through a metal detector from students on teachers. They had to go through a metal detector to get into the schools. And their, their model was that you've got to tick boxes, the teacher's got to tick boxes on a monthly basis on behaviour problems and academic achievements and truancy and all sorts of things. Uh, and they used that as a guideline. Would there be change? They wanted to see, they were hoping that over, over a two year period that they'd see a 30% reduction, improvement in the good stuff, reduction in the bad stuff. And they got a 92% improvement in the, in the good stuff and a 93% uh, reduction in the bad stuff just by changing diet. Mm. So it's massive, that story. It's, and we've got all these behavioural problems and so much of it comes back to what people are eating or not eating. Uh, and a lot comes back to the soil and eating healthy food. And I'm really anti the um, elitism thing that comes with organics. Honestly, the organic stores up our neck of the woods, uh, you know, having said this, maybe to be, to be profitable that I have to head down that route, but I've avoided it. Because you walk in there and, you know, like, I mean, apples are $12 a kilo and tomatoes are $10 a kilo. Who can afford it except a few elite yuppies who can go in there and buy their good food or the their Byron cancer Bates. and their Yeah, the <laughs> Byron Bay people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's ludicrous prices for the food. And food, we're not paying enough for food. There's no doubt about it because no one's making any money farming. And part of that story is the middleman story because the supermarkets make plenty of money and the farmers just for surf and a surf dim now. Yeah. So that has to change. We need to have you know cooperatives, the farmers d- dictating a bit more. They almost need unions to stop being run roughshod over like they are currently. But we need to understand the importance of food and understand the real value of food. We don't need to pay those absurd prices, but we need to pay a little more and we need to have the farmers. Like There's a farmers cooperative in Japan and it's based on this Japanese term that refers to putting a face to your food. And this is a cooperative that has supermarket chains across the whole country and your, your table is there with your produce on it and if you've got one thing, when you've got short table, if you've got 20 things, you've got a large table, and there's a big photo of you and your family or your workers and your philosophy. And if you don't produce food with forgotten flavours, extended shelf life, and greater medicinal quality, people don't come to your table and you're out. So it's self-policing, and it's just a wonderful success mm. story. And that's the kind of thing that a change I want to see happen. And that will change everything. Yeah. It's massive, the potential of it. So much. Yeah. That's cool. It's yeah. like really getting to the cause, yeah, that's isn't it? The, the cause, soil yeah. is like really yeah. getting to the cause of a yeah. lot of things. It is. It's huge. Yeah. Well, that's it, isn't it? It's the, hum- the humus, the human and humus. Yeah, of and for <laughs> human and humus mean of and for the earth, and humility is from the same word, and it's ironic because it's the lack of humility that's brought us to our knees staring down the chasm, but we've got to change that and realise yeah. you work with this wondrous blueprint and that's what science is. That's the definition of science. You can't do better than perfect. Mm. That's the simple thing to understand. Cool. Yeah, pretty good note. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I was just thinking about Nelson this whole time, like our producer who does all the subtitles yeah, and everything. Yeah. And I was just thinking he's going to have a great time trying to get some of these words. <laughs> <laughs> he might have. <laughs> he, he's Venezuelan too. So. Okay. So, so just to... Uh, to for the for the the clothes, what uh, do you have going on at the moment that people need to know about, and uh, you want to share? Uh, well, about, um, yeah, what's next? You for know, you? I've I've got a blog called on? the Nutrition Matters blog. I do presentations all over. You can look at. You can go to the website, which we'll is be at one tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, www.nutritech.com. You'll see where we t- where the talks are and so forth, and you can get access to the blog. Get a copy of my book when you sign up for the blog. But probably more importantly is the Nutrition Matters podcast, and that has turned into this global phenomenon with hundreds of thousands of listens. And, and essentially it's just, I guess I'm trying to leave leave something when I'm gone as I get older, and I've just decided I'm just going to share everything I ever learned about everything. And people think I'm mad because you know, you're in business still. So I just do that, and I teach all of the tricks that you can do things most cost-effectively and how you can brew your own living organisms, and people just seem to love it. It's just gone crazy um, people kind of will listen four and five and ten times and write notes it is difficult because you've seen how i talk it's like drinking from the fire hose as they call it <laughs> <laughs> you've got to strap yourself in to listen to it but but um but you know that you can re-listen with podcasts and you know even though they're really long some of the more recent ones have been three and a half hours they're in six segments so you can just choose i'll listen to this and next time i'm on the tractor or heading in town i'll listen to the second bit and 
Uh, it might take you a week to listen to it, but you know, and then you listen again because there's so much in there and you want to write notes usually. But there's so much there, and it's been so oh, rewarding yeah, well. to see. So rewarding to see the changes you know, all over the world. Just emails every day of, oh my god, I did. Even simple things like, you know, I have a human health segment in there, and one of the uh, things I was talking about joint issues and so forth. And this very very important finding from a West Australian doctor that you can make a solution that just involves borax from the supermarket and there's a whole thing, you put a teaspoon and drill it and you take so many mils of that a day. And he had this ridiculous results with, um, uh, with people with osteoarthritis, which is a lot of people over 60, just insane results with this boron drink. And he put it into a capsule and he got stomped on by everyone. Uh, and then he funded the research and it's really good peer-reviewed published research from Melbourne University of these remarkable changes with that and they just buried it. So I covered that in the podcast and so many people have come back and said, oh my God, that boring re- remedy you shared is just life-changing. And not one fish, I'm talking dozens and dozens and dozens of people. Wow. That, so. j- just on that, that's very interesting because doesn't borax, doesn't borax, boron reverse the, the um, fluoride Yes, yes. So the part of the issue with fluoride and the fact that, you know, it was, was a tool used by the Nazis to make people apathetic and the argument is that it calcifies the pineal gland, the pineal gland, then what we call the third eye and removes or reduces your link into the bigger picture, uh, which, you know, seem, is actually feasible and seems to be part of what's happening and boron could be one of the things that can correct yes, that. But I mean, right. my uh, move into this this fascination with the whole getting back to root causes with human health came from a tour with uh, you know, one of my great mentors and he's written one of the very best books in this field. It's called The Farmers and Ecosystem and his name's Jerry Brunetti, brilliant human health consultant. And uh, I was touring and I rang my parents at home because they were getting older, elderly and see how they were. And mum said, you better have a talk to your dad because it may be the last time you hear his voice. And I said, what? And she said, well, he's got this problem with his parathyroid gland, which governs calcium metabolism in the body. And the calcium is building and building. And now you get things like atherosclerosis because mm-hmm. calcium at high levels then goes into the cells where it's not supposed to be and creates hardening of the arteries and so forth. And so their solution is to just cut out the parathyroid gland, but in the process, because it's next to the voice box, they very often nick the voice mm. box and you haven't got a voice. And that's relatively common. Hence, mum's suggestion I talked to him while he had a voice. I hop in the car, into the plane flying from South Australia to West Australia for the next stage of the seminar tour we were on, sitting next to Jerry, told him the story. He said, you have tested his boron levels? And I said, no. He said the parathyroid won't work without enough boron. So I call them when I get there and say, cancel the operation. No, we're not going to cancel. We jump the queue, we can get in. I said, well, you're not going to die if you've got to wait four more months. You can't die from it in that short of time. Please, I'll pay for the test. Please cancel. So they did. We tested. You know, it was blood, urine, and I don't know, it was just blood and urine. But anyway, basically, there was no measurable boron that we could find. We gave them boron, and the parathyroid came right, and it was fixed. And then I realised how many times do we pull out the scalpel with a, with the medical industry, the modern medical machine, that has forty to sixty minutes of nutrition in a seven-year degree, and all you're qualified for is really to treat symptoms because you don't know that. Yeah, we look at the World Health Organization study called Nutrition Disease. They couldn't find a major disease, and we're talking 30 diseases that didn't have a powerhouse nutrition link. And we've got a whole medical community that never learned about that. And all they do is pull out the scalpel. And how many times does that happen? Many, many, many times. So I decided that I'd develop expertise and root causes of why you get things, and mm. that's what I've done in the soil and plants and animals and humans. So Very that's where it comes yeah. Yeah. One one last one last uh, question. I just wanted to go back to the soul. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we missed that. We're about to close yeah. it up. This might go. There's this more might. questions, but we'll have to save them for another time. But you mentioned, you know, <laughs> well, you said something about the body, and then there's the soul. Yes. Uh, but you, we're also saying that humans is humus. We are of the earth. Yeah. So what what to you is the soul, and is the soul in in outside of the body too? If we are the earth of the earth, no, we're part. I mean, the, na- the I see God as being. Na- I mean, nature is this wondrous interrelated thing, and I feel, um, you know, in terms of, it, it's fascinating thing. You know, like when you when you're on your deathbed, you basically have this clarity, unless you're on morphine, and then you don't have the clarity. But if you have this clarity, and you realise that life's about how much peace and happiness you achieved in that short lifetime, and then. People have regrets, and lots of them. Uh, and one of the things that no one ever said, I mean, there's a really good book by Bronnie Ware. She's a palliative nurse for people in their last months, and lots of them over, over many years of doing that. So she wrote a book called The Top, Top Five Regrets of the Dying so that you could perhaps get to that point without having those regrets. 
But one thing that she noted was that there wasn't a single person who said, I wish I'd worked harder and bought more stuff. Not one person <laughs> ever said that, you know. Uh, most people said they wished they actually actualized who they were, you know, recognizing that you're born as this, this blank computer program and that first five, seven years, as Freud said, give me a child for seven years, I got him for life. I mean, and that's all about others' expectations of who you should be. And the journey of life is you becoming you and not someone's expectation of you. And what most people realise is I never did that, you know. I, I, I followed those expectations. I did things that I wasn't happy with. I wasn't myself. And it's too late to change now, and that's a regret. So it's very important that you don't do that. But back, that's not answering your question. That's not turned into a politician suddenly. <laughs> no, no, come on, please. <laughs> answer, don't yes. do that to us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the question, sorry, just repeat the question well, again. About what the, well, the question was, is the body just in the... Uh, is the no, so the I body? see it. So for me, when I talk about peace and harmony and that recognition that the measure of a good life is how much peace and harmony, I feel that... When I'm in nature, when I'm even even when I'm working, and it's fascinating in that context because if I'm working there and, and I still love, even though I've got all these large farms, I love vegetable gardening or even flag. I just love gardening, and I just get with a sweat on my brow, sun on your shoulders, birds all around you. You're in the moment completely with what you're doing, and the smell of a healthy soil. Uh, there's just I'm just I've got this meditative thing happening, and I just feel at one with everything, which is the big goal is to feel at one with everything around you. And interestingly, and this is not science, it's just, an, just a, an observation, now we find that you know, the, the smell, that beautiful smell, comes from a group of organisms in the soil called actinomycetes. And what we know about this creature that's almost half fungi and half bacteria and produces volatile chemicals that give a health, healthy smell is that it's a signpost creature. And if it's there and those smells are there, the health is the soil food web, the soil community is healthy and functioning. So your nose knows, and there's no exceptions on the paddock. You've got a bad paddock here with all sorts of diseases. Smell it. Some smells like nothing or it smells slightly sour. And the better the soil, the better the smell. But now we discover that that smell, those volatile chemicals, trigger the production of serotonin in human mm, beings, the feel-good yes. hormones. So it's all interrelated. It's this wondrous thing of interrelationship. Uh, and, you know... Far, the farmers' health is shocking. You know, it's only recent figures have shown that we've got double farmers have got double the levels of most degenerative diseases, three times the depression, three times the alcoholism, and four times the suicide of the next closest profession. And I know of no regenerative farmer on the planet, and I know thousands who's ever committed suicide. And I reckon you're supposed to smell a healthy soil and that broke the serotonin, and you didn't mm. feel like yeah, killing yourself. That's it. And that's not a that's not science. That's just my observations. But I've not seen an exception, and that's pretty weird. But if you look at that whole story and you see things like, uh, you know, if you foliar spraying, which is a hugely important way to get nutrition directly into the plant and bypass any imbalances, which are often about having too much of something that shuts down something else. So you bypass that and go straight into the leaf and you're aiming for the underside of the leaf because it's got all these little mouths called stomates. And those stomates can open up to seven times their normal size and there are certain things that stimulate stomatal opening. And, the really, and so one of those is the mineral called potassium, but the second one's really fascinating so Rachel Carson wrote a book that changed the world, literally One Woman Changed the World, and that book was called A Silent Spring. And that was about the height of DDT when basically there were no birds in whole regions. What's DDT? DDT, yeah. DDT is the most destructive insecticide ever used. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, yeah. we, 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 squeak, yeah. we squeak that with consultants when they start talking in acronyms. So DDT is the, is the, her, is the, the insecticide that people used to use. This adds... Great big posters, a woman in the little little um, aprons, and the whole family oh, sitting around I for their sitting around for their, for their for their Sunday dinner, and she's got one of those copper, and she's spraying. Yeah, it's, same, it's for, know, but like why it's an insecticide. Insecticide because it kills everything. That's it. it was used so DDT. widely that it killed birds as much as it killed insects. Ah. And so there were whole regions where there were no birds. And what happened? And so her book then led to people protesting. It was number one on the new bestseller list for year, for months or years, and then. They put pressure on politicians, and it led to the banning of this terrible, this terrible insecticide, this really toxic insecticide. But during that period, where there were whole areas with no birds, they said, "Well, why is production falling off in that area? How the hell was that working?" And then they discovered that the frequency of early morning bird song, that all those birds that go crazy first thing in the morning, that opens that little mouth, <gasps> it's full size, and there's dew, and the plant has a drink, and there's dust on the dew, and it's got those minerals, and the plant has a drink and a feed first thing in the morning, and it's all interrelated. Wow. 
That's cool. That's what a trip. Ha- well, that's harmony, isn't it? The, yeah, and that's how the it is. All, the whole thing is just interrelated, and we're part of this wondrous thing, and that's what God is. It's that incredible interconnectedness and wondrous thing that it is, and we're supposed to look after and nurture that, not butcher it. Uh-huh. That's we the custodians. Yes, exactly. That's beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Graham. That's okay. And uh, if you didn't catch it before, www.nutritech.com.au. Beautiful. Yeah. Check it out. And uh, the Nutrition well, Farming Podcast. Yes, the Nutrition it. Farming Podcast, which is on it's, uh, it's on Spotify and Spotify Apple and all the rest of it. Cool. I'm going to okay. get into that. Check it out. Yeah. And uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll have to have a. Uh, a part two of this sometime. This is yeah, we'll catch him again. Yeah, sure, sure. Or sure. one of your other tours. Um, but uh, thanks everyone for listening to the episode. Uh, you can follow our podcast Design on Purpose on YouTube, uh, on Spotify and all the audio uh, platforms as well. And we're also on social media, on Instagram, TikTok, all those things, Design on Purpose. Stay tuned for another episode. Thank you. Thank you. Better go and see my farmers now. <laughs> <laughs>